Hello, and welcome to the Star Workshop. I'm David Wieneman, and I've been asked by your company to show you through the maze of investment options to educate, not advise. This video workshop will help you plan for retirement. You will learn to make better use of your company's savings plan and to select the investments and savings that work best for you. You might wonder why the workshop is called STAR. Well, STAR stands for something. Actually, it stands for a number of things. One of the things STAR stands for is saving to avoid risk, because that's what most of us want to do. STAR also stands for some strategies that we'll show you to protect yourself against risk. But first, let's talk about savers. This is a workshop for savers. A saver is the kind of person that Will Rogers was talking about. In 1928, somebody asked Rogers what he thought of returns in the stock market. He said, to tell you the truth, I'm more concerned about the return of my money than the return on my money. Now, the opposite of a saver is a trader. Traders make big bets and they take big risks. If a trader thinks he can make money by taking a risk, he's probably going to go for it. Some traders make a lot of money, but a lot of them lose their shirts. Like I said, the Star Workshop is for savers. Those of you who are most concerned about the return of your money. The number one goal of a saver is to take as little risk as possible. Most savers will walk away from a big return if it means taking a big risk. Now that you've seen both sides, does that mean that everyone is either a saver or a trader? Not at all. As you know, nothing in life is that black or white. Most of us fall somewhere in between. One of the things that we will do in this workshop is help you determine just where you are on that line. We will teach you how to assess your own tolerance to risk. You will see that your attitude toward risk is one of the most important parts of your saving strategy. We will talk a lot about risk in this workshop, but first, let's talk about why you need to save. In this section of the workshop, we will talk generally about saving for your retirement. You will decide where you want to go. You will learn how compound interest and inflation affect your savings. And you will see how much you need to save each month to provide for your retirement. Now it's time to take the first step to decide where you want to go. Remember the Cheshire Cat from Alice in Wonderland? Alice asked the cat for directions at a fork in the road. When the cat asked her where it was she wanted to go, Alice said she didn't know. In that case, the cat said, it doesn't matter which way you go because you won't get anywhere anyway. Like Alice, you have to decide where you want to go. Saving for retirement takes a personal commitment. You have to decide if that's what you want to do and you have to decide how you will do it. This workshop can help you decide how to do it. You might ask, why do I need to save if I have Social Security and a company pension? Your future financial security really has three parts. One part is your company pension plan. It's a big part, but it's not designed to stand alone. You also have Social Security. But to really stand financially strong in your retirement years, you need the added stability of personal savings. Your personal savings are an important part of your overall retirement plan. In fact, most experts suggest that your savings should provide one-fourth of your retirement income. You will have help as you save for retirement. As you probably know, your savings earn interest, and those earnings get plowed back into your savings. That makes your savings grow faster. And since you don't pay taxes, on the earnings in your company's savings plan, that makes your savings grow faster still. But there's something else going up as your savings grow. Prices. We are all aware that as the years progress, 
So does inflation. Today's 50 cent candy bar was only 10 cents a few years ago. The same can be said of a postal stamp, a pack of gum, and everything else. Inflation is a fact of life, and it's the enemy of every saver. It can eat into your savings. In order to beat inflation, your savings must earn interest equal to or better than the rate of inflation. It's not what you make that counts. It's what you keep after inflation. Let's look at that another way. Here's a stack of 100 one dollar bills. If you invest that money at 6%, the earnings on your savings will make the amount grow to $106 after just one year. If inflation is running at 5%, it eats up five of those dollars. Your savings only earned one dollar after inflation. Now look what happens if you get 8% on your money. Inflation still takes away five dollars, but now you have three dollars left instead of the one dollar you had before. By increasing your earnings from 6% to 8%, you tripled your real earnings after inflation. Okay, so far we have seen that your savings are an important part of your retirement and that inflation can take a big bite out of your savings. So even a small increase in what you earn in your savings can make a big difference. Now let's make some dollars and cents out of all of this. How much should you be saving? We have included a calculator in your package to help you decide how much to save each month. Most experts suggest that your retirement savings should provide about one-fourth of your retirement income. As a starting point, take one-fourth of your current monthly income and find it in window number one. In window number two, pick the interest rate that you expect your savings to earn. If you are like most savers, and you put your savings in your plan's most conservative option, you can expect to earn about 6% over the long term. Now look in window number three to the age closest to your own age. Hold on to your seat, because that's the amount that you need to start saving right now, each month, to meet your retirement goal. Were you surprised? Most people are. There are only two ways to reduce that monthly savings amount. You can lower your expectations, or you can increase the earnings on your retirement savings. The rest of the workshop will show you how to increase those earnings without going out on a limb. You have a number of investment options under your company savings plan. Let's talk about the basic choices, what I like to call the what's's, as in, what's a stock? What's a bond? What's a GIC? And what's a mutual fund? Let's start with stock. When you buy stock in a company, you become one of its owners. The owners of a corporation are its stockholders. The nice thing about being an owner is that you get a piece of the company's profits. Several times a year, the company pays part of its profits to shareholders. Those profits are called dividends. The rest of the profits go back into the company. There is no set price on stock, and there is no guarantee of a dividend. In fact, the price of a stock is really only what people think it's worth. Stocks can be risky in the short term, but that risk can be reduced over the long term. I'll show you how later. Now for bonds. What's a bond? Bonds are the way that a company borrows money from the general public. When you buy a bond, you are lending a company money. The company then agrees to pay you back over a set period of time with interest. The interest is fixed for the life of the bond and doesn't change. Bonds are normally less risky than stocks because a company has to pay back its loans before it pays its owners. But you will normally make less from bonds than stocks. And bonds are not entirely risk-free. Let's say you buy a 10-year, $1,000 bond that pays 8% interest, the going rate. Okay, 
Now jump one year into the future when the going rate has risen to 10%. Remember, the interest on your bond is fixed at 8%. You wouldn't pay $1,000 for that 8% bond when you could get a new 10% bond for that same $1,000, would you? Of course not. Now, let's say the going rate had dropped to 6% instead of going up. In that case, your 8% bond would look pretty good. In fact, your bond would probably be worth more than the $1,000 you paid for it. So, you see, when interest rates go up, the value of a bond drops and vice versa. It's a seesaw effect. And it happens whether you sell the bond or not. It even happens with government bonds. In other words, if interest rates go up, your savings plan statement may show a loss on bonds guaranteed by the government, even if you didn't sell them. But keep in mind, their value will rise when interest rates go down again. Now let's take a look at GICs. Most of us are pretty familiar with GICs. They are what your savings plans, guaranteed fund, or fixed fund are invested in. What's a GIC? GIC stands for Guaranteed Investment Contract. GICs are investment contracts written by insurance companies and banks. You can get them only through your savings plan. They generally look like savings accounts or certificates of deposit, except that if you withdraw the money before you reach age 59 and a half, you will pay taxes and a penalty. GICs are generally considered safe investments, but they are not risk-free. Despite their name, GICs aren't guaranteed by the government or by your company. In the unlikely event that the bank or insurance company went bankrupt, you could lose money. Now we get to mutual funds. What's a mutual fund? A mutual fund isn't a kind of investment. It's a way of investing your money. As an investor, you can magnify your investment power by pooling your savings with other investors. A mutual fund investment manager has the savings of thousands of people to invest. The fund manager uses this large pool of savings to buy a number of different investments for the fund. The main advantage of investing through a mutual fund is that even with a few dollars, you can spread your savings over several investments. As you will see, spreading your investments is one way of reducing risk. There are mutual funds for nearly every type of investment. There are mutual funds for stocks, others for bonds, and some that invest in several different types of investments. One of the benefits of your savings plan is that the company has been careful to select quality mutual funds for your savings. If you plan to invest other savings with mutual funds outside the plan, you should carefully select your fund on the basis of quality and reputation. We have seen why you need to save and the kinds of investments that you can use to save. Now we are going to see how those investments work. The first thing we will look at is how to avoid getting hurt by fear and greed. Then we'll take a look at the three laws of investing. These laws will help you increase the return on your retirement savings without going out on a limb. For starters, let me introduce two characters who can really cause problems for you. The first is a pig. His name is GERF, which stands for Greed Inevitably Replaces Fear. The second is a chicken. His name is FERG, which stands for Fear inevitably replaces greed. Some people believe that fear and greed make the market go up and down. Whether that's really true, fear and greed can hurt you as a saver. There's a saying on Wall Street that bulls get rich and bears get rich, but pigs and chickens get slaughtered. Let me give you an example. For a moment, 
Follow Ferg Gerf and me back to May 1990. Stocks were at an all-time high. People felt like the sky was the limit. And if you didn't jump on the bandwagon, you were going to be left in the dust. A lot of people were drawn into the stock market that spring. A lot of them were drawn in by greed. They ended up buying at the top of the market. Then the roof caved in. The government raised taxes. Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Within three months, the stock market had dropped 10%, then another 6%. People felt like the bottom had fallen out of the market. Fear took over and chased a lot of people out of the market. And of course, they lost money. But what happened to the people who didn't panic? They saw the stock market recover within two months and go on to new record highs. The people who hung in there when the market dropped didn't get hurt. When you choose investments, watch out for fear and greed. You should make your choice based on your goals and your sensitivity to risk. That's what the three laws of investing will help you do. The first law is nobody beats the system. Law number two, risk goes down over time. And law number three, the where is four times as important as the who. Let's take a look at each of them. The first law is that nobody beats the system. Nobody. Now, that sounds nice, but what does it mean? Well, first you have a system. In this case, the system is a rule. And the rule is, risk goes up with return. If you want to make more money, you have to take more risk. And if you're a saver, you had better have a way to protect yourself against that risk. We'll talk about how to do that shortly. For now, let's get back to the system. Risk goes up with return. The least risky investment is a GIC. It's also expected to pay the lowest return over the long term. Next come bonds. Bonds are more risky than GICs, so they pay more. Then there are stocks. Stocks are more risky than either bonds or GICs, so they pay more than either of them. Now, that's really just common sense. But for some reason, when we get into the investment area, it's like we stepped into the land of Oz. Everybody's looking for a wizard with a magic way to get a better return risk-free. We all want to believe that we can beat the system. The first law of investing is that there is no magic. Nobody beats the system, not even the pros. Several famous studies have compared professional money managers against investments picked by throwing darts at the financial pages. Guess who won? Throw the darts about 20 times, and your picks will beat most professionals. If you can beat the pros by throwing darts, then there probably is not a Wizard of Oz. In other words, you probably are not going to improve your return without taking on additional risk. So remember, whenever someone promises you a higher return, it means higher risk. That's okay, as long as you can protect yourself against that risk. Now for the second law. This one tells you how to protect yourself against the risks that we have been talking about. The second law is, risk goes down over time. An investment like common stocks can be pretty risky in the short term, but it's a lot less risky over the long term. Based on how stocks have done in the past, there is a one in four chance that you could lose money in stocks over a one-year period. That's pretty risky. Over a five-year period, the chance that you will lose money drops to only about one in 20. Much lower, but still a bit risky considering this is your retirement savings. Now look at a 10-year period. Over 10 years, the chance of losing the money you've invested in stocks is one in 100. And historically, 
there has been virtually no chance over a 20-year period of losing money in the stock market. Remember, the more time you have, the less risk there is that you will lose money. In other words, time is your friend. For another example, think of Babe Ruth, the home run king. Did you know that he was also the strikeout king? That's because every time he stepped up to bat, he tried to hit a home run. He struck out about as often as he knocked it out of the park. Even so, the Babe had an impressive 354 batting average. But even he said he could have hit 600 if he'd been willing to hit singles and doubles. What about you? When you're saving for retirement, you don't have to hit home runs. Saving for your retirement is not a get-rich-quick proposition. Let time be your friend and go for singles and doubles. The third law is the where is four times as important as the who. It's probably the most important of the three laws. Remember how nobody beats the system? One of the things we said was there isn't a Wizard of Oz who can increase your return without increasing risk. We also said that risk and return both go up with the kind of investment. Stocks are riskier than bonds, so they pay more. The point is that it's the kind of investment you make that determines how much you make and the risk you take. In other words, where you put your money, stocks, bonds, or GICs, is much more important than who the manager is. So the really important decision is, where will you invest your savings? In stocks, bonds, or GICs? Or spread out among all three? In the next section of the workshop, we'll show you the specific strategies to protect yourself against risk. These strategies will help you decide where to invest your savings. The STAR strategies will give you the tools to put the three laws of investing to work for you. You will be able to earn more on your retirement savings without going out on a limb. There are four strategies. Open your workbook and you will see a chart with the letters S-T-A-R. There is a blank next to each letter for you to write in the key word that each letter stands for. Let's take a look at each one. S. S stands for spread, as in spread your savings among different investments. Don't put all of your eggs in one basket. T. T stands for time, as in use time to protect yourself against risk. The longer you have until retirement, the less you can be hurt by investment risk. Remember, time is your friend. A. A stands for attitude, as in, know your attitude toward risk. You should never take on more risk than you are comfortable with. And R. R stands for regulate, as in, regulate your savings. Make your contributions regularly to the same investments. Don't try to time the market and move large amounts at the same time. As you get closer to retirement, Start moving regular amounts to your plan's most conservative investment. We have seen most of these strategies before because they are simply applications of the three laws of investing that we have been talking about. In other words, they are really common sense. Now we are going to see how they work. Spread your savings around is best illustrated by what your grandmother told you long ago don't put all your eggs in one basket. The best way to reduce your risk is to spread your savings among several different investments. Why is that so important? If you put all your savings into a single investment, you could have big problems. On the other hand, if you have diversified or spread your savings around, you reduce your risk. That's one of the good things about a mutual fund. It spreads your savings among a lot of different stocks or bonds. There is another way to spread your savings even more. You can place some money in your planned stock fund, 
some in bonds, and some in the GIC fund. Now we come to the T. Use time to protect yourself against risk. We have already talked about the time to your goal as your number one defense against investment risk. The more time you have, the less risk can hurt you. Let's take a look at two examples to see how you can use time to your advantage. Jane, for example, is 35 years old with 25 years until retirement. The odds are in Jane's favor that over that period of time, she will make around 10% return on her investment savings in the stock market. Jane doesn't care if the stock market drops this year or five years from now because she has at least 20 years until she needs to touch that money. Fred's story is different. He is 60 years old and he doesn't have the same cushion of time that Jane has. In fact, due to medical problems, Fred may have to retire at any time. Fred could be hurt by a drop in the stock market. Most experts would recommend that Fred invest his savings in one of his plan's more conservative investments. Consider your age and how long you have until retirement when choosing the types of investments to make with your retirement savings. If like chain, you have 20 years or so, then you were probably protected from the risk of the stock market. But if you have little time, then you aren't well protected against that risk. We are now at the third star strategy. Understand your attitude toward risk. This is probably the most important of the star strategies. It's the one that will help you sleep at night. Your attitude toward risk will determine your ability to sit tight if you need to and use time as your shield against risk. Think of it as your Sominex factor. Let's go back to savers and traders. Remember that very few of us are completely one or the other. There is a scale and most of us fall somewhere in between. Let's take a closer look. Very conservative investors are at the extreme end of the saver scale. They will invest their savings only in the highest quality investments with a fixed rate return. Examples are federally insured CDs and savings accounts, GIC funds, and money market funds. Conservative investors stick mainly with high quality, stable investments. Conservative investors often put part of their savings in high quality growth investments. For example, most of a conservative investor's savings will generally be invested in GICs or bonds with smaller amounts invested in stocks of very large, well-established companies. Moderate investors generally seek a balanced approach. They normally spread their savings among several different types of investments with different levels of risk. An example would be to invest half in stocks and half in bonds or GICs. Aggressive investors seek high returns from growth investments. They maintain a long-term view and use time as a shield against investment risk. For example, aggressive investors may place all of their savings in common stocks, but only if there is enough time to protect against risk. The very aggressive investor really is not a saver at all. This is the classic trader. The very aggressive investor will take high risk for maximum return and is willing to use any type of investment. For example, traders often place all of their savings in stocks and move their money in and out with market changes. Okay, now it's time to evaluate your attitude toward risk. Please take a few minutes to answer all five questions on the Sominex Factor page of your workbook. Add up your score and fill in the total. Next, look at the chart to the right. This will give you an idea of what type of saver you may be. The last star strategy is R, regulate your investments. What I mean by regulate is, don't try to do everything at once. Make contributions and changes in small, gradual steps. Again, select your investments based upon how much time you have until retirement 
and consider your attitude toward risk. Regulating your savings also means allotting a regular amount each and every month to your savings plan. Over a period of years, that money will grow. As you get within five to 10 years of retirement, you should reevaluate your investments and slowly begin moving from riskier funds to more conservative funds. If you shift your investments a little bit at a time, a change in market conditions will have a lesser impact on your savings. To summarize the STAR strategies, spread your savings around, use time to protect yourself against risk, know your attitude toward risk, and regulate your savings. Let's start putting together all the things you've learned so you can make your investment choices. The first step to putting things together is to set your savings goals. There are two types of savings goals, primary and secondary. Your employer has set up the company's savings plan to help you save for your retirement. This is the primary goal of your savings plan. The plan is a long-term savings program. It's not a Christmas club, and it's not intended as a way to save for the short term. However, you can use the plan to meet certain other savings goals. We'll call these secondary goals. Secondary goals can include saving for a house or a child's college education. Most financial planners recommend you save between three and six months salary that you can get to quickly. These savings are an emergency fund to help you through a period of illness, disability, or any other event that keeps you from working. You can use the savings plan to build your emergency reserve, but a personal savings account may be better. Remember that it may take several months to get your money from the plan. Also, you will have to pay income tax and possibly a penalty on any amount you withdraw from the plan. If you save your emergency reserve outside the plan in a personal savings account, you can reach it more quickly and you won't have to pay taxes or penalties. A better way to use the savings plan to help meet secondary goals is to borrow from your account. If you need to, you can borrow up to one half of your savings plan account balance to make the down payment on a house or a child's college education. The loan is repaid by payroll deduction. When you borrow from your retirement savings plan, you're borrowing money from yourself, and the interest you pay goes to your retirement savings account. Remember, the primary goal of your company savings plan is to help you save for your retirement. If you withdraw money from the savings plan before retirement, it hurts you three ways. First, there is the tax and penalty that we talked about a minute ago. Second, you may not be able to replace a withdrawal, and if you do eventually replace it, you will have less time to retirement. That means your savings will have less time to grow, and you will have less time to serve as a protection against risk. That means you will have to either settle for less or go out on a limb. Now, take a minute to complete the worksheet at the end of Section 5 of your workbook, which outlines your primary and secondary goals. When you have finished the worksheet, you will be ready for the last section of the workshop. We have said that you should base your investment choices on your risk preference and the tying to your nearest goal. You have now rated yourself on both of those, so you have the tools you need to make your investment choice. Before we go any farther, mark down your risk preference and the time to your nearest goal in your workbook at the beginning of Section 6. Keep in mind that you may not want to put all of your savings into one type of investment. Particularly, if you rated yourself conservative or moderate, Spreading your savings among several different investments is one way to reduce investment risk. We have put together an example of how spreading your investments affects your risk and return over different periods of time. Take a look at the investment table in section six of your workbook. Let's say you rated your risk preference as moderate. 
Moderate investors generally split their investments. So let's look at putting 60% in bonds and 40% in stocks. How long to your nearest goal? Let's call it 10 years. Read across the 60-40 row to the 10-year column. You can see that you would expect to make somewhere between 3% and 15% per year over 10 years. That's not bad. Suppose you don't have as much time to your nearest goal. Take a look at the five-year column. Over five years, you might not make anything, or you might make as much as 17%. Why the difference? As time grew shorter, your return became riskier. Remember, your investment choice should be influenced by two things, your risk preference and the time to your nearest goal. If you have less time to your nearest goal, you should probably look at a more conservative mix of investments, more in bonds and less in stocks. If you have more time, you could be more aggressive and put more in stocks. What's most important is that it feel right to you. Now it's your turn to look at the investment categories and decide how you will invest. Start with the time to your nearest goal and your risk preference. Use those to find the area of the investment table where you're the most comfortable. Take your time and consider different options. Ask yourself particularly if you are comfortable with the minimum amount. And remember, you are hitting singles and doubles, not swinging at home runs. Now it's time to fill out your election form using the instructions your company gave you. If you have used what we taught you in this workshop, you will be on track to increase earnings on your retirement savings with a minimum of risk. Remember, saving for your retirement is a long-term proposition and nobody beats the system. Your best defense against risk is time. The more you have to your nearest goal, the less you can be hurt by risk. So as you draw closer to your goal, gradually move your investment savings to the most conservative fund in the plan. Use the STAR strategies to make wise decisions and to protect yourself against risk. Spread your savings. Use time to protect yourself against risk. Know your attitude toward risk and regulate your savings. That brings us back to where we started. What does STAR stand for? Well, we've seen that it stands for a lot of things, but most importantly, STAR should remind you that your savings goals should be the stars that guide your investment decisions. Thank you.